Hello, and welcome to the lecture for chapter 23 from Conceptual Physical Science, 6th edition. In this chapter, we're gonna talk about geological time. So this chapter is gonna involve how scientists measure geological time and how they read the rock record to determine that geological time and basically break up that huge time frame of hundreds of millions or billions of years of Earth's history into digestible chunks in terms of understanding, okay? So let's look at the, the table of contents. So we're gonna look at how we use rock, uh, record relative dating in terms of the rock record, how we also use radiometric dating, which we actually talked about when we talked about the atomic nucleus and the idea of having half-lives as a measure of time. So we're gonna to return to that idea for its, for its very specific application to geology. Then we'll just talk about the broad concept of geological time, because if we compare it to other time frames, it's much, much slower. Right? So you think about a human lifetime, well, that's only about 100 years maximum, where, of course, geological time is on the scale of hundreds of millions of years and even billions of years. Then we'll actually talk about specific eras, the Precambrian time, the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and finally the Cenozoic era, which are all in order going from oldest to newest. And then we'll talk about early history in a capsule. Okay. And by the way, when we talk about the different eras here, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic, they're often defined by biological events. So this is definitely physical science meets biological science a little bit. But of course, the methods for determining the eras are firmly rooted in the physical sciences. They just inform the biological sciences, although definitely that information goes both ways in that it's a two-way street. And just to reiterate, this is the fourth chapter in our unit on geology. This is, I guess, arguably the, the last of the true geological chapters, because the next two that are broadly in, in geology include studying the oceans, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter, in chapter 20, um, 24. And then in chapter 25, we're going to talk more about the atmosphere and meteorology. So, but we're still kind of all in this earth science or, or you know, broad ge geology, geological science as a broad topic. Well, let's get to it by talking about the rock record and using the rock record for relative dating. So, as I've said a few times, the, t the overall time frame of the Earth is billions of years. In fact, it's about four and a half billion years. Okay, that's how old the planet is. The first half billion or so, the planet was mostly molten. We talked about that is the argument of why the core of the planet is so much denser because in its mostly molten liquid state, denser things were able to settle to the interior of the planet. So in other words, in the early, 100 million years of the planet, it was very different than it is today. It was just a primordial ball of, of molten material as, as things crashed into it and as the solar system formed. But at some point, about maybe three and a half billion years ago, the Earth was very much like it is today, but with almost no life except for some simple bacteria living on it. And then things have just been changing ever since with plate tectonics and the growth of the oceans and all sorts of different things happening. So compared to a single calendar year, we could think of condensing those four and a half billion years into that one calendar year to help us understand where things happen. So we would take the formation of the earth on January 1st. We would have the oldest rocks actually solidifying in late February, okay? So that's kind of the end of the molten stage of the planet. Bacterial life is gonna come a bit later than in the next month near the end in March. Then much later we have dinosaurs. So you see dinosaurs, which you think of as something that's occurring in the ancient history, which did occur tens to hundreds of millions of years ago, depending on which type of dinosaur we're talking about. But look, that's not until December, December 14th to 26th, which is actually a re relatively long era for one type of organism to dominate the surface of the earth. But still, that's near the end of the year. That's getting up near modern earth. And then we think about Homo sapiens. Well, Homo sapiens evolved on the last day of the year at 11.50 p.m. Because Homo sapiens have only been around for about two, well, about two million years, okay? And then human history would start one minute to midnight starting at about 10,000 years ago, okay? In terms of like the first um, actual record of like, of, you know, permanent cities in places like the Middle East. All right, so just, just to give you some perspective of how geological time is so much greater than, say, historical time, All right? Or even dinosaurs, you know, were relatively recent in the age of the planet. Now, interesting thing about relative dating is there's this principle, which is uniformitarianism. Now, uniformitarianism, tarianism, which is a mouthful, is an assumption and a reasonable one that Earth's geology is the result of slow processes over long periods of time. So some layering of processes, 
Now, when you actually think about digging down and finding older things, that's a little hard to understand on the time frame of a human lifespan because we don't think, think about things getting buried over time. But over thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, things do get buried. Now, obviously, things can get churned up due to activity from from the plates coming together, volcanic activity, mountain ranges getting pushed up. But for the most part, old things get covered by new things. That can just be layers of biological material getting stacked on top, layers of sediment, layers of even dust being carried by the wind. But all those, all those ideas, all that layering is a slow, gradual process. So this uniformitarianism assumes that the natural laws have been constant throughout geological history. There's, there's no point where different laws applied, where gravity was reversed or magnetism dominated over gravity. Those, those just simply are, we exclude those possibilities because they just seem incredibly astronomically unlikely. It seems like the same physics has been around for definitely 4 billion years. And this applies to our understanding of, of um, astronomy as well, this uh, understanding how planets formed or other star systems formed outside of our own. So certainly we think the same physics has applied since the very beginning. So the rock record is like a very long old book with many pages that are tattered, torn, indecipherable, and missing. Okay, So there's quite a bit of careful dissection that involves piecing together that story. So the two methods of dating rock, and you know it's not not easy. We can't, it's not just simply a matter of you know digging down and looking at clear, clearly cut layers. We have to carefully bring things together. We have to use relative dating. This is the relative age, which involves the ordering of rocks in sequence by comparative ages. Okay. So in other words, the deeper rocks are older. And then we can then look for similar depths, similar layers in different parts of the world and say, oh, these occurred at the same time. There are dramatic examples of that, such as one layer due to a global event that we can find throughout the geological record all over the planet. And then we can date relative to that layer. But it's always relative. OK, but there is there is also absolute dating where we use the idea of radioactive half-lives to do radiometric dating. This is an absolute age, the actual age of rock determined in a laboratory. The reason we don't use this all the time is not all rocks lend themselves to radiometric dating. There are rocks that are made out of small elements that aren't radioactive or have very few radioactive isotopes, and we have no good way of dating them. There are only really a few good isotopes that are allowed for dating, and they're not in all rocks. So we are limited to which rocks we can date absolutely. So the idea about the, the rock record is that it is originally horizontal. All right, so original horizont horizontality. In other words, new layers of sediment are horizontally laid down over those older layers, as I was talking about a minute ago. There's also the principle of superposition. This says that in underformed sequences of rock, the top layers are younger than the bottom layers. Furthermore, there's cross-cutting. A fault or intrusion that cuts into a rock is younger than the rock it cuts through. So if you look at some, some event, right, such as an intrusion of water, an intrusion of a, a glacier, and it's torn away the rock, we can say that that event happened later than the rock it tore, tore through because obviously the rock had to be there first. So very reasonable uh, preposition there. There's also inclusion. So any inclusion is older than the rock containing it because it had to already exist in order to be included in the rock. Essentially, it had to be broken down, carried there, probably deposited through some sedimentary process, and then combined with the rock. There's also lateral continuity, and this allows us to date separate rock outcrops from similar characteristics. So that's the idea of looking for the same sort of layers throughout North America, for example, or even all over worldwide in terms of certain very, very unique layers. There's also faunal succession. So this is in using the fossil record to help understand the rock record. So fossil organisms follow one another in a definite irreversible time sequence. We know one organism you know, evolved from another. We know that more complex mobile um, animals evolved from simple sponges. And those simple sponges evolved from animals that didn't, that didn't really, that weren't animals, right? They evolved from some sort of you know, more primordial organism. And so when we look at that, we can clearly say, oh, well, these fossils are older, therefore the rocks they're in must also be older. So. There are certainly gaps in the rock record, and these are called unconformities, and it's constantly a struggle with the science, and we're always trying to fill in those gaps. An angular unconformity happens when tilted or folded rock is covered by younger horizontal rock, okay? 
So this is obviously th this is a case that not there's not always there's not just a perfect layering down over time. There are cataclysmic events that shift things around, and then layering will continue on top of the remnants of that cataclysmic event. So let's consider how we would date things using some some logic here. So we have three dikes, which are igneous intrusions. Okay, dikes is the, the name given to this particular type of igneous rock that's that's happening inside of some pre-existing rock, probably sedimentary. They cut into a rock body, as shown down in the picture below. The question is, which dike is the oldest and which is the youngest? To, to determine that, look at the dikes and look which dikes cut through each other. Right. So there's the pre-existing rock layers, right, shown by these layers here. There are, and then there are three dikes, dike A, B, and C. So which is the oldest and which is the youngest? Take a minute and think about it. Think about the idea, the principle of inclusion, that any inclusion is older than the rock containing it. And therefore, any inclusion, inclu inclu um, including, you know, cutting through another inclusion, well, which one must be older? Okay, got your answer? So C is the oldest, because look, C is cut through by B. That means B must have come later. Furthermore, dike B, the inclusion, the igneous intrusion, B, excuse me for calling it inclusion, is an intrusion because it's cutting through. But dike B is cut through by dike A, which means dike A must be the youngest. It occurred last in the geological record. So the embedded rocks inclusions, now we are talking about inclusions, in the sedimentary layer are what? Are they metamorphic? Can we say that confidently? Are they B older than the sedimentary layers? Are they younger than sedimentary layers? Or are they the same age? So what was the idea there? What must they be? They must be older, right? So these, these inclusions shown here, these granite inclusions, must have already been there when the sedimentary layer was laid down. And they got pushed in and fitted into that sedimentary layer, but they must have already existed, all right? They were part of this igneous rock layer that's deeper down, but unless you dug down there deeper and found it, you, you, know, you wouldn't know that for sure, but you could certainly just know by the principle that it, once you find that inclusion, that had to predate the sedimentary layer that it's included in. Okay, so all that relative dating definitely uses a lot of kind of logical reasoning out, and it, I think it holds up, it's common sense. Now let's talk more about radiometric dating. Now I would highly recommend it if you're really confused about the physical principle of using the radioactive nucleus and the and understanding half lives, go back and and reread or re or rewatch the lecture on the atomic nucleus because I certainly talk about that there. But more specifically about radiometric data date, dating used for geology, well this process gives us the actual age of the rock by measuring the ratio of radioactive isotopes to their daughter products, okay? So what the isotopes became when they decayed. They decayed through some process, alpha decay, beta decay, whatever it may be. Now the half-life is the time it takes for half of the parent isotopes to decay into their daughter products. So half-lives that are important for geological timescales um, involve particular isotopes of uranium-238, uranium-235, potassium-40, and carbon-14. These are all great for geological dating, okay? Now, carbon-14 is more used for fossils and, and usually for things that are more recent. So it's, it's kind of, it's not so important for geology unless you're dealing with more like really recent sedimentary la layers, like, you know, recent peat that hasn't become coal. And you're kind of interested in tying that in with, with early, early human history or prehistory, okay? Because carbon-14 becomes nitrogen-14 with a half-life of 5,760 years. So good for measuring things on the scale of a few, ten, few tens of thousands of years. On the other hand, potassium-40 becomes argon-40, and that takes 1.3 billion years, so a very slow process. So finding potassium-40 in rocks can really help you date the rocks, as long as you know the original population. So you have to know about the, basically how much potassium-40 of that particular isotope occurs naturally. And that does require some, some understanding about, well, does, does that natural occurrence vary? Did it vary over Earth's history? You know, so you have to be able to piece that out. Now, you also have uranium-238 and 235 that both become isotopes of lead with half-lives of 4.5 billion years in the case of uranium-238 becoming lead-206 or the much shorter half-life of 704 million years, although still very long, of uranium-235 becoming lead-207, okay? And these ones are particularly useful for geologists, also astronomers, when they, when they study asteroids because it allows them to date asteroids. But we use it here on Earth to date the rocks on the surface of Earth. So radiometric dating can give the actual age of a rock, absolutely, okay? An exception to the actual age can be found in what? Sedimentary and some metamorphic rocks, igne igneous rocks, 
metamorphic rocks or sedimentary rocks? What do we mean by an exception? What do you think here? What's your best guess? Well, it turns that it's sedimentary and some metamorphic rocks, okay? Because in the sedimentary rock, the age of the individual minerals can be determined, but not the age of the sediment, because the sediment is made of those little pieces, right? So when we date the pieces, we know when those pieces were formed, when they were cooled, because that's when the isotopes, you know, when new isotopes stopped entering the mixture once it became a solid. And then that population of isotopes eventually decayed into the daughter, the daughter product, right? So that's the idea. You know when the pieces were formed, so really, really, this is this idea of radiometric dating. What is it most useful for? Igneous rocks, okay? And why would metamorphic rocks also make an exception to the actual age? Well, because when the mineral is reheated and metamorphosized, that sort of resets the clock. Because if it gets reheated and reliquified, that would allow isotopes in the surrounding material to seep back in, which would then change the population. So you you don't know then how old the rock is anymore. Okay, so really, it, it's it, this process of radiometric dating is can only be used definitively for igneous rocks that haven't been remelted or haven't been broken up and turned into a sediment. So, but still, there are lots of cases of that. So it's it's still it's such an important tool. We just have to use it correctly. That is radiometric dating. Okay. So let's talk about the overall geological time scale. We've talked a bit about the mechanisms and talked about how they are building off ideas that we saw in previous chapters. But this next part of, the, of this lecture and these slides is saying, okay, well, now that we know that and we know there's definitive ways or, or very successful ways of, of dating you know, geological processes over time through, you know, through excavation or looking at, at you know, up, uplifted layers of rock, then what, what do we know? Like what, what are the actual time frames? What, are, what parts of Earth's, Earth's history, its geological history, have, have we been able to determine? And how do, how do science, scientists represent that overall history? Well, they do it with named eras, okay? So there's this, this wonderful way that we, we talk about the overall history, the same way that we talk about eras in human, in human history, in recorded history, in terms of you know, pre-World War II or the you know, between the wars or the Napoleon era, or the, you know, the age of discovery, right? The Renaissance, right? These are names of periods of human history. Same idea for geological history. We have names for these different periods of time, okay? So the calendar, right, of Earth's history, and we're not comparing it to, you know, necessarily to, you know, the, month, the months of the, uh, you know, comparing it to one year of a, of a Earth, Earth year calendar. I'm not, not doing that anymore, but that's the same idea. But the calendar of Earth's history was originally created using relative dates. So it, it, this whole idea of predates the ability of radiometric dating. It was done, you know, back in the 19th century um, and 18th century. Okay, but since then we've confirmed the dates of radiometric dating. The specific dates using um, radiometric dating have been added in, and we subdivide geological history into units. And those units are called, in terms of, of biggest time frames to, to progressively smaller time frames, eons, eras, periods, and epochs. Okay, and they really are firmly rooted on changes in life forms. So biology kind of defines the different namings. Okay, so what's going on then? Well, we've got starting back 4,500 million years ago, which is to say 4.5 billion, because a thousand million is a billion. So when you see 4,500 down here, that of million years, because MA stands for millions of years, then you're talking about 4.5 billion. So that's the beginning of the earth okay that time that eon is referred to as the pre-cambrian time okay so that's basically the very very early earth and we have the hadean which refers to hades that's when earth was like hell because hades is you know the latin hell right or you know from from the latin mythology then there was the archaean the proto-rozoic right these are all the different eras within the eon of pre-cambrian time and pre-cambrian time is kind of a catch-all phrase all right so it's these these particular terms pro proterozoic archaean and hadian whether whether they're called eons or eras it kind of or a period for that matter it kind of depends who you ask but the point is that these are very very early up to about 2.5 billion years ago although the proterozoic ends at this division right here starting at five 543 million years ago, okay? Now, what's interesting is that that's really kind of where we get to thinking about life that we know well, right? So certainly there was life and we find, we find examples of, of simple organisms that lived three billion years ago. In fact, there's a whole branch, a whole kingdom of life called the, the, the arcane organ, organisms, okay? Based on the fossil record. So there was certainly life in these, these early 
eras or periods of Earth's history, but it's, we just don't know as much about it because it's so long ago. But then we get into kind of the, the, the eras of history that we know very, very well, geological history, from the fossil record. So again, informed by biology. And that starts with the Cambrian period. So you see right there, the Cambrian period. Cambrian period is so important, starting at about five, 500 million years ago, or about 550 million years ago if we round, because that's when the first plant fossils are rec recorded in the fossil record, okay? And we're able to date those fossil records with radiometric dating based on the layers they're in. We find out that's, that's this key point, key point in Earth's history. It was called the Cambrian Expo Explosion. Huge number of different organisms evolved over, for, over a period of a few million years, and really kind of Earth started to look like this vibrant place full of life, okay? Starting with the Cambrian period. Now, the Cambrian period is part of, we're talking eras here, it's, uh, excuse me, it's part of the Paleozoic era, okay? So the Paleozoic era is, a, is the first of the big eras, the eras that fall into the eon of the Phanerozoic, okay? So that Phanerozoic basically encompasses all of the, like, the fossil record that pe people study he heavily. Because the Precambrian time, there's very few fossils, okay? So there's not a lot of study, not a lot of research done. So the Phanerozoic is basically, you know, 90% of research that's done in terms of past eras of, of the Earth includes the Phanerozoic. So when we talk about that, we talk then mostly when scientists talk about, the, you know, looking back in time in the geological record, they talk about either the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, or the Cenozoic. So Paleozoic is the oldest, it's Paleo, so it's old. Mesozoic means middle, so it's the middle era. And then Cenozoic is the most recent era. Okay, so looking then at the oldest era, the Paleozoic, we have all these periods, right? With very interesting biological events happening. Cambrian, first plant fossils, as I already said. The Ordovician, the first vertebrae fossils, right? So actual animals with backbones. Then we get into the Silurian, where the first insects are found. Then the Devodian, this is where amphibians evolved, and we start seeing amphibians show up in the fossil record. Then we get into a, um, an era called the Carb Carboniferous. So the Carboniferous is defined by huge trees that had evolved, but at that point, the basically the fungi and the other organism, organisms that break those trees down had not yet evolved. So when the trees die, they turn into thick, thick layers of fossilized trees. So huge expanses of fossilized trees, which then never happened again in Earth's history. But we see that very clearly defined in the, you know, the, recorded, the recorded layers because they, they left this layer of, of fossilized trees. The Carboniferous is split into the Miss, Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian, kind of de depending on where those layers were discovered. That's where the names come from. Then we get into the Permian. So the Permian is the last of the periods in the Paleozoic era, and it's when reptiles first evolved. Now, reptiles led to dinosaurs, and dinosaurs show up in the Mesozoic initially with the Triassic period and the Jurassic. Now, within the Jurassic period, dinosaurs were ruling the Earth. They were definitely the most dominant life form, but birds started to evolve around that time, and there was certainly a, a lot of com you know, a comparison between later dinosaurs and early birds, and, and perhaps you know, they, many dinosaurs evolved into those early birds. Then there was the Cretaceous, which also had many dinosaurs, okay? But then we have the end of the dinosaurs, some, probably some uh, crashing of a meteorite or a, um, a small comet into the planet caused a drastic change in the climate that may have already been changing. And we have really kind of the end of the era of the dinosaurs ending at about 65 million years ago. And then we get into the Cenozoic era with two different periods, the tertiary and the quaternary, okay? And when we get up in the end of the quaternary, the Holocene, we're getting up to the conditions where early humans evolved. Okay, so pretty interesting stuff. Although very early humans actually evolved way back in the Pleistocene, but the Holocene is where we think of, you know, kind of, you know, that's like when you know um, humanoids were interacting with Neanderthals, you know, some few hundred thousand years ago. Okay, so hopefully that's kind of a neat, a neat review of all these eras because it's certainly a, a lot of information and it is kind of fun to think about all these names and all the incredible amount of different organisms that lived throughout Earth's history. You know, I said, we're definitely treading on the toes of biology a bit here. So let's summarize these a little bit, all right? So we got the Precambrian time. The Precambrian ranges from 4.5 billion years ago to about 543 million years ago. It concludes 90% of Earth's history, okay? But again, we don't know that much about it. 
There was definitely considerable volcanic activity, especially early on in the, the Hadean period. There was meteor, meteoritic um, bombardment, um, bombardment, excuse me, meteorite bombardment. And this wasn't just Earth. Whole, every planet in the solar system was bombarded at this time. It's called the era of bombardment in, in, um, in terms of astronomy terms. There was also cyanobacteria, which still exists today, but was one of the early organisms to evolve. Lots of soft body organisms, some that we just have speculated about because they left no fossil record because they were soft body. There was also a primitive atmosphere and certainly some liquid oceans, but the oceans would have been much smaller than today. There would have been the beginnings of the lithosphere, plate formation and movement, but probably not full plate tectonics like, like we know today. Right? That, that would have come you know, some, some tens or hundreds of millions of years later. So we, when we talk about pre-Cambrian fossils, the most common one, the one that scientists come back with the most to, are stromatolites because they grew in these big chunks and almost like um, uh, coral does, and they left around, they left that that bony structure behind. All right. So the material deposited by algae, microfossils of bacteria and algae, and the importance of cyanobacteria were all all evident in these stromatolite fossils. There are some plant fossils that show up in the middle pre-Cambrian primitive animal um, fossils in the late Precambrian, and diverse and, multi, and multi-cell organisms existed by the close of the Precambrian, okay? So there's definitely, definitely you know, it, it, we can find out sometimes that maybe we were a little bit too conservative and there were earlier animals, earlier plants, you know, before the Cambrian, but certainly not at the huge level that we see in the Cambrian period, okay? So then we get into um, the, or talking a little bit more about the Precambrian, excuse me, the first atmos- atmosphere, you know, forming really early in the Earth, was primarily hydrogen and helium. Notice there's no oxygen in there. We'll come back to that. The second atmosphere that was driven by volcanic outgassing, because there's, you know, so much volcanism early on, and cometary impact, so these, you know, comets being, you know, having a lot of water in them when they, they uh, crashed in, started forming a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere as well as water in the atmosphere, but still no free oxygen. Now, the H2O condensed to form the oceans. So much of the oceans that we have today were actually brought in by comets. The water, the water that exists in the liquid oceans on the surface of the planet wasn't there when the planet was formed. It came later through the impact of comets. At least that's the prevailing theory. Then there was a third atmosphere that formed later in the Precambrian where there was a removal of CO2 to the rocks. So the CO2 started locking or the rocks started locking in that CO2 as certain rocks are able to do. There was an increase in nitrogen and there was an increase in oxygen because photosynthesis began, right? There started to be organisms that were photosynthesizing. It's not just plants. Algae can photosynthesize as well. And there was development of ozone, O3, okay? So that third atmosphere was really starting to form by the end of the Precambrian. So let's do a check here. The development of free oxygen was crucial to the emergence of life on Earth, okay? One thing led to another, right? Because it led to the formation of what? Air for animals to breathe. Ozone, which helped screen Earth from harmful um, incoming UV radiation. Ozone, which primitive organisms could breathe. Or was it because the oceans, you know, it made the oceans where life emerged? Well, it turns out that it was ozone was the biggest, biggest factor. It was the fact that the ozone helped create a, basically an atmosphere that screened out UV and screening out UV radiation meant there was less random mutation in these organisms, which allowed more complex organisms to actually, you know, live to maturity and breed successfully and allow those more complex organisms to live. Because otherwise the radiation makes it so only small organisms can survive, which is so interesting, right? That biology is really dictated by the amount of ambient radiation, how much radiation is getting to the surface of the planet. And having ozone absorbing that UV radiation is a big deal, okay? So it's not just the breathing of oxygen, it's the ozone, right? Okay, in terms of the oxygen being our atmosphere being so important. Okay, you, although you don't want too much because then you get too much of a greenhouse effect. All right, let's do another check. The evolution of cyanobacteria helped oxygen escape to the atmosphere by doing what? Keeping the carbon and expelling the oxygen, photosynthesis, releasing it from carbon dioxide, or all of the above? Well, it's actually all of the above, right? The, the cyanobacteria was able to release the oxygen from carbon dioxide, basically splitting the oxygen apart from the carbon. It was able to produce it through the process of photosynthesis, right? That endothermic process that requires the intake of, of solar energy, and it kept the carbon and expelled oxygen, right? As plants do. Okay. So then we get into the Paleozoic era, right? So this is the, 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 the first of the three area, eras in, in the, pheno, the Phenozoic um, eon, okay? So basically this starts with Cambria, the Cambrian period, okay? So this era spans a bunch of different periods, six periods to be complete, right? And again, this was all in the figure back in the previous slide, so maybe you want to have that in front of you and referring to it 
as I'm, I'm talking about these, but the six periods within the Paleozoic era, okay, include starting off very importantly with the Cambrian, that initial explosion of life, right, starting about 300 million or spanning 300 million years, but starting about 500 million years. So this one starts at about 550 million years ordovician all right? Then the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous, and the Permian, okay? So the periods are characterized by changes in life forms, the fossils representation or the fossil representation due to the hardened body parts, right? That's how that's how we come up with these these eras, right? And they're not perfectly divided, they're generally divided. Okay? So each period had some changes in both life forms, in tectonics, right? The continents were moving around, the sea levels would rise and fall depending on the, the climate, which would change, become colder and warmer. Shallow seas covered the continents, marine life flourished during this this entire era, the Paleozoic, you know, even with its all its diverse periods, was very much still marine focused. Not a lot of terrestrial life. The some, but not a lot. The changing sea levels contributed to diversification of life forms. The Cambrian explosion was the great diversity of life that evolved during this time of 543 to 490 million years ago, during the Cambrian period, the first of the periods of the Paleozoic era, right? That really beginning point of the most important geological record. This had a lot of hard body organisms that we can see in the fossil record and the ability of these organisms, organisms to secrete calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate for the formation of outer skeletons. So important, right? Both for their own survival and diversification of life, but also for us to study because you know that those outer skeletons remain. Okay. There was abundant and diverse uh, marine life within the Ord Ordovician period. This was the emergence of vertebrates, as I talked about, jawless fishes, pretty cool. This also had a surge in the rate of extinctions, okay? So there was mass dieouts, right? But then there, there was, that was opportunity for new life to evolve, at least on the scale of 10 million years. A mass dieout can be scary to live through it, but Earth as a whole recovers. So the many land masses on, on a journey to become the southern continent of Gon, Gondwana land, right? This was, this was one of the first major supercontinents of the Earth, right? All the, all the continents we know today were very, in a very different shape, and this one of those early formations was Gondwana land. And the rest of the ocean, would, the rest of the planet would have been oceans. This was situated close to the South Pole. So think of that. The only land on the planet was close to one of the poles. There was widespread glaciation, as you would imagine, right, because it's near the pole, and the sea levels dropped and shallow water invertebrates were deprived of a habitat, right? So we had a lot, a lot of habitat, total loss, thus, you know, we have whole types of organisms that just died out, okay? So the supercontinent of Gondwana land near the South Pole in the Silurian period persisted. The ancestral North America and, Eu and Europe began convergence and are situated near the equator. So now we have a new, a new major continent forming near the, near the equator. This, this equatorial continent really led to the first blooming of terrestrial life. That's when in the Silurian period, you start to see plants, scorpions, and millipedes. So you really start to see the successful insects, right? On, and they're not going to show up on Gondwana land so much, which, you know, as I said, still persisted in the Silurian period, although it initially formed in the Ord Ordovician period. But is, they're going to form in the much more temperate and often warm, um, you know, equatorial continent of combining the modern continents, North America, North Europe, and Siberia. Okay, or at least plates. Gondwana land had um, completely formed in the Southern Hemisphere by the Devonian period. North America and Eurasia had joined as a continent of Laurasia within the Northern Hemisphere, so it moved up north. The Devonian period is known as the age of fishes, huge fishes, huge diverse fishes, many of which aren't around anymore. Right? There are two groups of big bony fishes, the lungfish and the lobe fin fish. Let me see these in the fossil record. So now, now when we get into the Carboniferous period, getting to the end of the Paleozoic era, we have a collision of these major continents. So Gondwana land and Laurasia, Laurasia being you know, that, that more equatorial continent, actually crash into each other, forming the Appalachian Mountains. That's how old the Appalachian Mountains are some 300 million years old, which is why they're so small today, because they've been weathered over those hundreds of millions of years and become much smaller than they were initially. They're probably as big as the Himalayas when they were formed back 300 million years ago. And the Ural Mountains, another heavily weathered mountain chain that's very ancient. So Appalachian and Ural Mountains were formed around the same time. And this was the creation of Pangaea, that one, that one supercontinent that led to the theory of plate tectonics, okay? Because it was, you know, Pangaea was this point where the modern, the modern continents did were kind of all fit together. And now after this, they start splitting apart. It was a warm, moist cl climate. So it is, you know, leading to these huge jungles, essentially. There was dense swamplands. 
and the present day coal beds were created. As I said, I said a few slides ago, there's these huge trees were growing at this point, these huge swamps and almost like Everglade forests, you know, but obviously, you know, with some very different life forms than today. But as they died, as the trees died and new ones grew and you had these layers within the swamps, well, those trees, they didn't, they didn't get eaten up today because today trees, trees get consumed primarily by fungi. There's fungi that break down the actual, you know, the actual molecules within the trees. But the, those fungi had not evolved at this point, so the trees is simply layered up, creating big, thick layers of basically biological peat. That peat then became coal over time. So, so much of the layers of coal that we dig up and use for, as a resource today came from this period of history. Insects were abundant, and the amni amniote egg evolved for the first time, right? Like a chicken egg, okay? So then we get into the Permian period, the last of the pa uh, Paleozo Paleozoic era periods. This persisted from 290 to 248 million years ago. Here we have amniote vertebrates that continue to diversify. There's an ancestral link to reptiles and mammals, right? So these early vertebrates definitely led to what we know as reptiles and mammals today. There was also a huge extinction event. 95% of all marine species just got wiped out. It was probably due to a lot of undersea volcanoes that just changed the composition of the oceans, right? So big, big die out. This die out carried over to land species as well, but not quite as dramatically, okay? The possible causes of this mass extinction were redistribution of water and land, changes in land mass, elevation, climate, lowering of sea levels, whatever is the fact, there's a huge die out, one of the biggest in Earth's history, okay? So, the Paleozoic experienced several fluctuations in sea levels. When sea, level ri when sea levels rise, what happens? Do shallow seas cover the continents? Just more wa or is it more water is tied up in glaciers, making the climate colder? Is it the climate turns warmer and swamps form? Or do, or do ocean, excuse me, or do ocean basins become shallow? What do you think is the most reasonable answer? Well, it turns out shallow seas cover the continents, okay? So you end up with continents that are quite small and huge expanses of seas. So big flatlands like you know, the central North American continent would just have been a, a shallow sea, a big shallow sea stretching across, okay? So at the end of the Permian period, sea levels lowered. The lowering of the sea levels could be a result of glaciation as Pangaea drifted near the South Pole, the collisions of Gondwanaland and Laurasia to form Pangaea. It could have been that tect tectonics and climate change um, affected that, or was it all of the above? It was all of the above, okay? Glaciation definitely would have tied up water, thus lowering the sea levels. Um, you know, just the very, the very act of the collision could have, um, could have lifted up the continent and tectonics and climate change as a kind of a catch-all certainly were driving those lowering sea levels. So then we get into the next era that has its own periods. This is the Mesozoic era. This one spans about 180 million years, starting at 248 million years ago and ending 65 million years ago. There are three periods in the Mesozoic, as we talked about earlier when we looked at the figure. These are the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. This is called the age of the reptiles. It's really the age of the dinosaurs, okay? And, you know, that's really all three of these periods were defined by dinosaurs to one extent or another. So Mesozoic history began, begins with the much of the world's land above sea level, right? So seas had dropped so much. There wasn't a lot of sea left, right? Just a few trenches. The seas um, um, invade Western North America, and then there's the breakup of Pangaea, right? So that really kind of starts the continents moving to their, the positions we know today. And it begins, okay, in the beginning of the Mesozoic um, era. And there's also the beginnings of the Atlantic Ocean, right? That, that Mid-Atlantic Ridge started to create the Atlantic Ocean, which hadn't been around. There was subduction of oceanic, oceanic crust produced, uh, which, which produced widespread uh, de deformation, vulc volcanism, and mountain building along the western coast. The mountains of, the western, of western North America began forming. The Mesozoic era, um, in terms of its life, well, it was, there, was, there were survivors of the great Paleozoic extinction. True pines and redwoods ex survived that time and continued to be successful on the surface of Earth. Flowering plants had an opportunity to actually become more successful than they had before. Insects continued to proliferate, and reptiles really got their first foothold as a major important species in the beginning of the Mesozoic era. Okay, so first true terrestrial animals readily adapted to the dry Mesozoic climate, much drier than the, the climates that had defined the, um, you know, the eras within the Paleozoic, okay, or the periods within the Paleozoic. Mesozoic life, well, dinosaurs dominated, right, throughout all three of the periods. One group of reptiles led to the birds, right, some, whichever group that was, you know, scientists are still deciding. Many reptile groups, along with many other animal groups, became extinct at the close of the Mesozoic probably due to a giant um, impact event. Possible hypotheses for this extinction, impact of a large asteroid or comet, 
and extensive volcanism, okay? But certainly it's, this is the prevailing theory. It's just that sometimes it might be combined with extensive volcanism. So the volcanism already made the, the, the world susceptible to a die out. And then there's that one event that made it so dramatic. So the breakup of Pangaea in the, in the Mesozoic was the greatest tectonic event in the Mesozoic. Of all the continental unions that existed in the Paleozo in Paleozoic time, which ones survived to this day? Africa and Asia, the United States and Mexico, Asia and Inda, India, or Europe and Asia? Well, it's Europe and Asia, of course. They're separate plates, but they're still together to this day. They were connected back in the era of Pangaea in the Paleozoic, and they're still connected to today. So then we get into the Cenozoic era, right? So we're, we're leaving the um, Mesozoic behind and we're getting into the most modern of the eras, okay? This one begins about 65 million years ago with the die out of the dinosaurs. A smaller fraction of geological time than either the Paleozoic or the Mesozoic. And that kind of makes sense that the, the, the eras get smaller because we're actually able to study more and more. There's more detail, right? Because the more recent eras, there's just, just more things have survived. Right? It's often called the age of the mammals because we have a huge proliferation, success, successful colonization of the seas by mammals, which hadn't happened at this point. This is where you have you know, whales and dolphins you know, kind of actually evolved from land organisms or returned to the seas. Um, Pangaea continues to, it, well, it's, its breakup is complete, but everything continues to drift apart. And there's two periods within the Cenozoic, which are just called the tertiary and the quaternary. And these ones don't have these particular events or organisms that define them as, as well as the eras of the, um, or the periods of the other eras, but they're just, they're just kind of with just that we break, we break them up more broadly, I should say. So other interesting things about the Cenozoic era, North America and Greenland split from Europe. The Alps and the Himalayas be, um, begin to form by collision of land masses. And there's ridge formation and plate movement that led to the San Andreas Fault. These are all things that, that happened geologically speaking, plate tectonic speaking in the Cenozoic era. Also, in terms of the climate and the effects on biology, there was a cooling of the climate. There was glaciation in temperate zones that happened periodically. There was one third of the land covered by ice, right, for some long periods of time. Marine mammals and large land, large land animals evolved. So there's definitely over these tens of millions of years, you had lots of, of mega animals, huge land animals that lived on the, on, the, on the land. And starting in about 4 million years ago, we have the ancestors of humans evolving in terms of Australopithecus, and then moving on, you know, you know like um, Homo erectus some 2 million years ago. So you have early humans evolving within the Cenozoic, but of course, certainly near the end of the Cenozoic, because we should appreciate that the Cenozoic starts 65 million years ago, and humans are only, you know, the last 2 million years of that. So glaciation during the Cenozoic resulted in what? Lowering of sea levels, carving in the Swiss Alps, land bridges connecting between various continents, or all of the above? Well, it's actually all of the above, right? So it had a lot of effects there. Land bridges allowed for migration of terrestrial animals that hadn't happened up to that point. Anytime there's glaciation, sea levels will lower. So this one certainly makes sense. And then we know that glaciers carry a lot of force so they, so they can carve out valleys that we see today in the Swiss Alps. So which of the following is the Senate is the Cenozoic era not no noted for? Debut of humans, ice ages, swampy conditions that later developed fossil fuels, great mountain building activity, the San Andreas Fault. Which is it? Which is the answer? Which one's the, one, the odd one out? The one that shouldn't be here? It's the swampy conditions. That one's from the Carboniferous. Okay, all right. Well, there we go. I hope this little review of geological time has been interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.